I've come from the Shannad, Kieran, just in the last two hours, and we've now just passed through uh, all stages in the Iraq this the safe access zones legislation. This has been something that's been promised for a long time. It's in the programme for government. And what it does is it creates a 100 metre safe zone around all healthcare providers so that women who want to access termination of pregnancy services and those who are providing the services can do so free of harassment, intimidation, uh, bullying, coercion. We have reports from right around the country. Now, it might be sporadic, but it is it is happening enough around GP practices, around some of our hospitals, where women are feeling very intimidated. And we had some really moving testimony, including from uh, colleagues of mine in the Shannon, where they were talking about their own experiences, where they had uh, they had a non-viable pregnancy, where they had a fatal fetal abnormality and they had to go in and they had to walk by people who were they felt were really intimidating them. Um, and so this is it's a modest measure, but it's an important measure in saying that everyone in this country and in this case, women looking to, to access legal services, termination of pregnancy services, that they can do so free of fear of intimidation. Uh, so it's a it's a positive move today. Uh, one listener has gotten in touch uh, uh, asking a question I would have put to you anyway. Does this now mean it's possible for the government to ban any protests anywhere for any reason? What's to stop a future government having safe access zones around somewhere you want to protest in the future? It, it seems a slippery slope to me. It's very specific to 100 metres outside uh, healthcare providers and it is very specific to termination of service, uh, termination of pregnancy service. So no, it can't just be amended to to apply in other areas. And there are there are many safeguards in there. For example, there's a 100 metre buffer zone around the houses of the Oireachtas. So that's completely free for anybody to protest regardless of whether there might be a GP clinic or something within, uh, within that 100 metres. There's another really important provision in there, which is it's not an offence to uh, carry out these activities within a safe access zone. The, the law is set up very clearly such that a guard can issue a warning and it's only if the person refuses to comply with the warning because people might in good faith not realise yes. that they are in contravention. And so it's not an offence to simply be in contravention. The guard has to say, look, you're in contravention of the act. You need to move along or you need to stop doing the following things. It's only if the person says no, having been warned, I'm going to continue to do that. It's only then that they've committed an offence. Would there be any appetite in the corridors of power to apply similar legislation to areas around politicians' homes, given some of the protests we've seen outside Roderick O'Gorman's house, for example, most recently? In, in truth, I don't know. I'm more than happy to give you my view. I've, I'm someone who's had multiple yeah. protests outside my house, uh, not all of them uh, particularly pleasant. If you'd asked me this question even six months ago, uh, I would have given you the answer that I'd previously given, which is, you ha which is no, we shouldn't legislate for this. I have to say, I found people, young men turning up in balaclavas outside Roderick's family home. Um, and remember, we've had a bomb scare, which has been reported at as well, at Helen McEntee's home. Um, this is moving into a different place now. We now have uh, well-organised extremists, far right. We've seen the violence uh, in, close to my own home in Newtown, Mount Kennedy, not organised or orchestrated by the people in Newtown, Mount Kennedy, infiltrated, violent attacks on Gardaí. Gardaí were, were injured. I think given that people are now turning up in balaclavas, uh, I think there is a conversation to be had because clearly uh, we have a very clear understanding of what, what people in balaclavas means in this country. It is a direct threat mm. Uh, to somebody's safety and and, in, and and it has connotations of a threat to somebody's life for the reasons we understand um, for, from, from the troubles. I think it's a conversation we have to have if we have got to a point where we now have politicians who are receiving bomb threats and uh, gangs turning up in balaclavas outside their home in the middle of the day. Do you fear we're on the path to a Joe Cox type situation in this country or that we're possibly on the path to something like that? Well, I, I really hope not, uh, but I, I can certainly tell you I've been in politics for 13 years. Uh, it has changed and it's accelerated in the last year or two. Um, what we're beginning to see here in Ireland. To, to, to cut across you, does, does that, do you think that is just on foot of a, a general level of toxicity kind of seeping into public discourse or is it orchestrated? It's both. 
it's both. There's, I, I, I see a few different things happening. I see uh, there is very well organised social media dissent. Some of it from within, from within Ireland. Some of it, the experts will tell you, is state orchestrated from uh, hostile countries. So young people in Ireland are being manipulated to, lied to, uh, and influenced in order to, um, you know, feel that the state is somehow against them. I believe we have, now not everyone will agree with what I'm about to say, but I, I've observed it now for several years. I believe that there are some in politics, and I see it unfortunately from Sinn Féin as well as some others, who have a narrative of, well, it is the ordinary person against the state. It is a war between the ordinary, good, decent person and the state. And where you see that... It, Trump, I don't think Sinn Féin use that rhetoric, though. Do they, they, don't, they don't say there's a war between the state and no, the No, in fairness, people. I'm sorry. They talk let, let about me, failures. And the state, in some ways, does fail people. No, let, me, let me retract that. You're right. They don't talk about war, in fairness. And I want to I, I wanna take that back. But if you look at uh, Mary Lou's contribution recently in uh, Leaders' Questions, it, it is all about this struggle of the ordinary, decent person against the state. Now... That is a populist uh, mantra that is was used very effectively for Brexit. It was used very effectively by Donald Trump. And I'm not saying it's just Sinn Féin, by the, by the way, for a, for, a, for a second. If you look at the kind of misinformation uh, that is being targeted at young men in particular in Ireland and, and across the Western world, you are seeing a... a a, a, an agitation. You're 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 seeing this, and I believe that is driving it to some to some degree. Can I ask you about uh, a story we covered on this show yesterday? Uh, about ten thousand people, just shy of ten thousand people, every week don't turn up for hospital appointments, outpatient appointments, for a whole variety of reasons. And we spoke to Martin Curley, Professor Martin Curley, who who had been in charge of digital tra- digital transformation within the HSE and found himself kind of banging his head off a brick wall, I think, in that regard. Uh, we spoke to Matthew Sadlier, who's a consultant as well, uh, working within the system. Uh, both of them made similar points, which is that this is a symptom of archaic uh, processes that still exist within the system. Pen and paper process that should be digitised. Well, there may be some truth to that, but let's first of first of all not absolve ourselves as patients who are meant to turn up for our appointments. Um, the the figures are that about one in seven people in Ireland isn't turning up for their outpatient appointment. We've had good progress on the outpatient lists. They are falling. This will be the third yeah. year in a row that they're falling, uh, particularly the long waiters. So, for example, last year, people waiting more than a year for their outpatient appointment fell by a third. And we are now on our way to our ultimate goal, which is everybody is seen yeah. within those 10 to 12 but, weeks. But yeah, but but and, and there will always be some people who just don't bother turn up. But if you look at the no show rates in the UK, that's about one in 14. Now, unless you're suggesting that Irish people are just kind of less obedient than people in the UK, it would suggest that uh, that an awful lot of people are not turning up because of failures within the system rather than personal flaws. I wouldn't frame it like that. I mean, let's let's take some responsibility for ourselves as as users of the health service, right? It is not a failure of the health service that people don't turn up for appointments that the health service has set up for them, right? Now, can the health service do more to minimise that? Of course they can. And we're seeing uh, more texts used. We know that the rate in NACE, for example, they brought in a new protocol last year and the do not attend rate fell by about 13%. There is more that can be done. There is more that should be done. The HSE launched a new strategy on this so just, sorry, just last year. I just want to year. be clear this. If somebody gets an appointment, gets a letter in the post and for an appointment that's four years down the line. And if they miss that appointment four years down the line, you said that's that's, that's just down to them. No, I'm Personal definitely, failure. No, I'm definitely not saying it that. It sounded like that's yeah, what well, you said. Oh, well, th- th- thank you for the opportunity to clarify. Let, let me read you out exactly what the strategy from last year says. Send the offer letter six weeks before the appointment. Send letters or text reminders two weeks before the appointment and send a text a few days before the appointment. Now, I don't think it'll surprise you to hear that lots and lots of people, uh, that experience will not chime with them or that that uh, protocol will not chime with their own experience. Which is exactly why it's the it's the new protocol launched last year to be to be rolled out everywhere. So there are hospitals now that are that are doing this. As I said, NACE, for example, has seen a reduction. I'm just saying we have something of a tendency to say, well, everything is the HSC's fault. And if you have been given decent, like if you've been told, say, six weeks ahead of time or four weeks or two weeks ahead of time, look, it's nine o'clock on Tuesday morning. 
there's a responsibility on each of us to turn up. Right. Yeah, but I don't think but that's the, can that's the HSE not the do more. Of course, the it reality can. is people are not being told six weeks ahead of time. The reality is people are not maybe finding out at all. Like somebody here is texting in to say that they're still getting letters into their front door uh, for people who lived in the house five years before them, and they've contacted the HSE told them this and the HSC keep sending them letters. We have another text in here from somebody who got a gynaecology appointment for their sons. Yes, look, I, obviously I'm not standing over any of that. I'm not for a moment saying it's perfect. I'm just saying we have an awful tendency to blame the hospitals for everything that happens. Sometimes it's partly on us to turn up. Of course there are situations where people haven't been given sufficient notice or the details have changed or indeed the, you know, the wrong letter goes to the wrong patient. It's a it's one of the kind of hangovers of us not having electronic records and not having a single e health system. Which well, is something when we're is that protocol on. going to be rolled out across the board? And what's stopping it? You could describe it as kind of last year's uh, protocol. This was uh, well, implemented. Launched. It's not happening. It's a strategy that was launched last year, so they're 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 rolling it out across. Why is it taking so long? It's nearly May. It's May already. I don't have a figure for how many hospitals it's in, but certainly they are rolling it out and where they're putting it in place, it is it is making a difference because half a million people not turning up. Look, we've put a huge amount of work and in fairness, our doctors, our nurses, our healthcare workers, they've put a huge amount of work into increasing the number of outpatient appointments. And the result of that is we are mm. now seeing very important at reductions in the amount of time people are waiting, which really is what matters. Why do you think, though, it's May and hospitals wouldn't have implemented that yet? Because Martin Curley, who we spoke to yesterday, said that there's a cultural resistance to implementing these types of changes. And by culture, he means people. There's people within the system who just don't want the system to change. Dysfunctional at all, as aspects of it might be, they like it. I don't know that there's people who will uh, say, you know, we're not going to send out text messages or we're not going to send out, uh, you know, we're not going to send out letters. Or are not, there people who are resistant to change? Oh, listen, there's people who are resistant to change in, <laughs> in every organisation in, in, uh, in the country. Yeah, that, that is true. Ultimately, are they preventing protocols like that being rolled out across the board? Well, as I said, I don't have the figures for how many hospitals uh, it's in. This would seem to be one of those what, that's, what's that awful phrase? Low-hanging fruit. This would seem to be one of those relatively easy things to do uh, that gets you a big return in terms of patients turning up. Um, can I ask about um, the two new hospitals uh, in the uh, newspapers today? Uh, these are the elective hospitals that have been long talked about. So the sites kind of revealed Connolly Hospital in Blanchardstown and Crumlin Children's Hospital that will be repurposed. So what lessons have you learned from the new children's hospital, the kind of the procurement process and the contracting and the financing and all of that, that would be applied to these two new projects that would make them, you know, more efficient, more transparent, more timely, more budget friendly. Yeah, more budget friendly. Uh, several things. And actually we're applying them to the National Maternity Hospital as well. So the National Children's Hospital, I think, is the first hospital the state has built in about 20 years. And we'll now have five on the go at the same, well, six on the go, the Children's Hospital, the Maternity Hospital and the four electives. So it is a good statement of intent in terms of investment and future healthcare capacity. We're doing things differently with the National Maternity Hospital and with the elective hospitals. One of the things I've instructed the Department of the HSE to do on the elective hospitals is within reason, make them the same. Right. So use modular approaches and um, don't create four different designs. Obviously, they have to be adapted for the sites they're on and for the scale. But within reason, we want them to be box shaped, straight lines. There's no harm with an architectural economy of scale. Well, just value for money building, you know, curves are expensive when you build things. And the Children's Hospital has a lot of curves in it. Uh, the new National Maternity Hospital, I asked, for example, to see the the drawings to say, look, it. of course, you can you can. You know, I mean, it should be aesthetically pleasing, but that's not where the money needs to go. The money needs to go inside the hospital for uh, healthcare services. Uh, we're taking a different approach with the elective hospitals. Um, we're taking a similar design for all four. Uh, we're looking at value for money engineering and the number of stage gate reviews essentially has been simplified because ultimately, Kieran, what happened after the National Children's Hospital is very complex bureaucratic processes were put in place to avoid that happening. The problem is they were so complex that they were adding years to healthcare capital projects, which in and of itself makes them cost a lot more money. So speed is of the essence with these as well. 
All right. Well, listen, before I let you go, I just want to ask about another story that's uh, getting a lot of attention today, which is uh, the clearing of the tented village, if we call it that. Uh, people, uh, asylum seekers who are in and around the International Protection Office on Mount Street, so they've been moved to Crooksling in South Dublin. They've moved to City West uh, as well to what is hoped is, is better and more suitable accommodation. I guess people wonder, first of all, whether they will stay there because this was attempted before and, and, and those asylum seekers came back. Uh, and the other question people have is, what do we do about the people who turn up tomorrow at the IPO offices and the day after and the day after and the day after that? Will another tented village not just appear somewhere else? Well, certainly measures are being put in place so that it doesn't happen in Mount Street. And the government, government has made it clear that this simply isn't an appropriate thing to happen. Uh, it's not safe for the people in the tents, first and foremost. And it's also not appro- appropriate for, for people living in the city, travelling through the city. The facilities in uh, Crooksling and in City West, they have access to healthcare. They have access to uh, hygiene facilities. They have access to uh, food, things that they didn't have access to really uh, in the tents. Ultimately, what we need to do is uh, pass this new legislation that Minister McEntee brought to government yesterday. Uh, We have to be able to to send people back to the UK. I know there's been a lot of debate about what the actual figure is, Mm. but the best estimate is that eight to nine in every 10 people now applying for international protection here are coming through the border. Sorry, the legislation that she's preparing, which will mirror legislation that existed before the High Court ruled the UK an unsafe country, we didn't deport anyone under that legislation. Uh, yes, Not a uh, single asylum seeker. Which is why Chris Heaton Harris, the Northern Ireland Secretary, was so confident on Monday, despite Rishi Sunak kind of criticising the Irish government, uh, in saying that, oh yeah, we've no problem with the legislation. I wonder, kind of, was there some level of schizophrenia within uh, the British Cabinet? Turns out there's not. They don't have a problem with the legislation because it's ineffective. What has changed is the moves in the UK, particularly around the threat to send people to Rwanda, has very significantly increased the number of people coming in here. So roll back a few years, roll back pre-COVID, which is really what we're talking about. There were about 3,000 people coming into the country a year seeking international protection. And the state broadly was able to absorb that number. Um, now, we can argue that the the centres that they were and the facilities were inappropriate and there was a move to, to do away, so with, we, to do we, away it, with that. The reason we didn't send people back isn't because we couldn't, it's because we didn't need to. Is that the argument? Yeah, I think that pretty much is the argument. We've gone from about 3,000 a year. It went up to, I think, about 8,000, 9,000 last year. The pro- projection is for about 14,000 this year. And of course, we are quite rightly accommodating a lot of people and helping a lot of people who f- fleeing a Russian invasion in their own country. Um, and what we do know as well, we've seen the, the uh, accelerated processing time, bringing it down to 90 days. Uh, we do know that the number of applicants for international protection from the countries that had this accelerated processing time fell by a half. So there are measures which uh, Minister McEntee and Minister O'Gorman are implementing we know they work. We need this new legislation through because, look, if eight in every nine mm. people seeking international protection, if that is broadly correct, and we think it is broadly correct, uh, are coming in through the north and coming from the UK, that is something that that simply has to be addressed. Stephen Donnelly, Minister for Health, thanks for joining us.